A lady, a lady told me one time that when she was a little girl, she asked her mother, Mommy, am I pretty? And the mother responded, Oh dear, you're smart. I actually watched a couple of you guys wince. Um, but I, I heard back a few more lady-type voices. That's not good, by the way. If your child, who is ugly as a fence post, asks you, Mommy, Daddy, am I pretty? If you're a little girl, you say yes. Um, years ago, another lady in a small group shared with the group, we were, we were talking about we were talking about things that had happened when we were younger and, and a lady shared with the group that her father had told her when, they were young, when she was younger that she was not planned and she, the word she remembered that from that conversation was that she was a mistake. Um, I was I was sitting at a table with church folks one day. We were in a we were in a meeting. We were in a committee meeting, and there was a lady across the table, and and Jackson was real real little, and and they had a little boy that was about Jackson's age, but she was talking about um, something from the 70s, and I too enjoy the 70s. But I was in elementary school in the 70s, and she was in college. And she said, she said something about college in the 70s, and I said, wait, now I'm smarter than this now. <laughs> I said, wait, I said, how old are you? And she said, yeah, I know, I know. And she said, I'll be 40 this year. And my response, I'm a wordsmith. I said, 40? <laughs> Like that, like that. My relationship with that lady was never the same. <laughs> think back, think back, think back on when you were a kid, think back on earlier this morning. There are times, there are words that you say, words that you receive and hear that change things, change sometimes drastically, sometimes words you hear and receive can alter your life. Best case scenario, they'll, they'll kind of alter what somebody thinks about you or their impression of you. For bad, as, as we've illustrated, or for good, uh, I was a youth pastor, 2003, I had resigned our church down in Huntsville, Alabama, and I was headed to a church over in Sumner County, and I was going to be, I was going to be a pastor, I was going to be a, a grown up big boy pastor of a church. Some DS somewhere put me in charge of a church. I, it's crazy today. It was crazier 20 years ago. But there was a man in our church, and one of my last Sundays in Huntsville as a youth pastor, one of my last Sundays in church, a, a saintly man named Moody Davis. Moody cornered me after church out in the foyer, and I had, I had preached that morning. And he cornered me out in the foyer, and he said, Rich, you are a fabulous preacher. You communicate in a way that people understand. Now, a couple of things. That was a lie. Because <laughs> I was not a fabulous preacher. I'm like two steps better today. But if you don't like my preaching, you can blame Moody Davis. Because he, 20 years ago, said, Rich, you're a fabulous preacher. That church in Tennessee is going to have a great 
leader. He spoke words into my life and they hooked. Our words have enormous power. And we've got to be careful with how we use them. Best case scenario, if I say something really stupid, your opinion of me changes. But worst case scenario, if I say something incredibly stupid, your picture of Jesus changes. We carry his name on our lives. We carry his name, and we've got to be careful, not just with our reputation, but with his, and the words we use matter. I'm going to be all over the Bible today, and I'm not going to read everything that I want to read to you today, but if you want to, you can turn to the book of Matthew, the first gospel, the first book in the New Testament, the, the gospel of Matthew in chapter 15, and I'm going to read you this kind of weird story. But Jesus takes what the Pharisees want to do to be argumentative and divisive. Jesus takes that and teaches everybody, including us today, Jesus can teach us if we'll listen. Matthew chapter 15, and it starts out like this. Then some Pharisees, now remember, if you, if you don't know who the Pharisees were, they were the Jewish leaders, the Jewish, the spiritual leaders, the leaders in the, in the synagogue and in the temple. They were experts in the law. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem. So they've traveled to come to Jesus, not to listen and to receive, but to question and to bring him under inquisition. They came to Jesus from Jerusalem and they asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, I don't know what your Bible says next, but my Bible says Jesus went, oi. Okay. Of all the things to be concerned about, of all the pressing matters in their world in this day, the religious leaders come and they poke Jesus in the chest and they say, why do your students, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, I'm going to give you just a moment to settle down because I know that's a big thing for you to take in just as I read it real fast. I know guys 2,000 years ago didn't wash their hands in such a way that made the religious people happy, okay? I'll give you... Okay, are you ready to move on? That was actually a, a religious custom. It was the law. It's actually the law. Today, this week, I went back and I, I, I Googled this because I wanted to get the Jewish term. The Jewish term for it is uh, the netilad yadayim. Ready? Thank you. Okay. It was a literal ritual a cup, a cup with two handles before going into worship, uh, before eating, specifically eating bread, anything that might have been considered holy, a two-handled cup. And if, if, you were a, if, if you were a practicing Jew, you would take it and you would three times wash your hands. You would, you would uh, back of the hand, front of the hand, back of the hand, and you'd take it by the other handle. Back of the hand, front of the hand, back of the hand. You'd put it down. You would uh, dry your hands off and then you would immediately take and eat symbolically a little piece of bread, kind of like we would communion. That was called the netalat yadayim. 
And then you would pray this prayer. Ready? Most Jewish prayers started like this. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. Almost every prayer would start like that. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to wash the hands. That's a practice for some Jews today. 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees came up, poked Jesus in the chest, and said, Why do your disciples not wash their hands right? Keep reading. Verse 11. Jesus says, You're missing the point. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth... That's what defiles them. Then the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you know that you've offended the Pharisees? To which Jesus, I don't know what it says next in your Bible, but to which Jesus went, oi. Okay, keep reading, verse 17. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach, then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these things defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. Not eating with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile them. This is a weird practice to us. But, but honestly, we Christians in 2023 in the United States, we probably have a few weird practices that someday Christians will look back on us and go, really? They did what? Why? Okay. Jesus himself, several times in the scriptures, I, I'm going I'm to race through a bunch of, I'm going to race through a bunch of scripture passages here real quick. Go, go back to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, Jesus says a little bit of the same thing in verse 33, says this, make a tree good and its fruit will be good and make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. He's talking again to the Pharisees and the religious yuckety yucks. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. Remember where we are. I need, you to, I need you to check your heart right now. Okay, some of us sometimes when we hear a message, we think, I sure hope Derek is listening because Derek really needs to hear this. Okay, you, you think, you think I, I hope somebody else. I, I, need, I need for you to listen, and I need for me to listen. God, what kind of words come out of my mouth. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment, ouch, for every empty word they have spoken. Zoinks. For by your words, you will be acquitted. By your words, you will be condemned. So again, go back to the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders were saying, Jesus, your disciples aren't washing their hands. Jesus says, that's tradition. Might be good tradition. It actually had its roots in the Old Testament, okay? It was, what, it was how God taught the, the workers in the tabernacle to come in and prepare for worship, yes. 
But over time, that tradition had gotten legs to when in Jesus' day, that's how you told, that's how you told the good folks from the, from the lay people. That's how you told the religious types from, from the secular types, is how they washed their hands, how they did rituals. The outward, observable holiness... And Jesus says, that's not the point. The point is, you've got stuff going on on the inside of you, and you know how we tell? Because it comes out your mouth. Go back to the chapter 5. At the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we spent a good chunk of last year in the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. How are you doing? Are you? Would, would your family say that you're the light of the world? Would your neighbors say that you're the light of the world? Would people who work with you say that you light up the room when you come in? Because let's be honest, some people light up the room when they come in. Some people light up the room when they leave. You, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before men that they might see your good deeds. And if I can rewrite Jesus here, I'm not allowed to do that. But if I could, I would say, or that your words that people might hear your words, see your good deeds, hear your words, and glorify God in heaven. I'm challenged. Me saying a careless word and you forever having a different picture of me because I say a careless word. You're 40? That's bad. But me speaking divisively me speaking and 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 bringing condemnation me speaking and not reflecting on Jesus well that's tragic as it is for all of us now, Jesus says more. Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 7 about true and false prophets, true and false believers. He says, by their fruit, you will know them. The, the apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3 in a section where Paul is instructing the church about how Christians should act in a pagan world. Paul says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whether it's your words or whether it's your deeds, do it in the name of Jesus. That same Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, let no unclean thing come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful. Go back and... Read your last 10 Facebook posts. Go back and think about the words that you said this week at work. Go back and think about the words you've said. Let no unclean thing come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for, this is great, building others up according to their needs that it may benefit. Man, I could have preached out of Ephesians 4. Your words should be helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it would benefit them. Are your words beneficial? James in chapter 3 says, the tongue is small but makes great boasts. Consider what a great fire is created by such a small spark. Mommy, am I pretty? Oh, baby, you're smart. How long does that take? How long does that entire conversation take? About six seconds. And that little girl's self-image can be changed in six seconds. Think about the words you've said to your kids, your spouse, your coworkers, your neighbors, the words that you've said. 
Bad is when it changes their image of you. Tragic is when it changes people's image of our God in heaven. In the Proverbs, oh, the Proverbs is full of this. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one whose rash words are like a sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Every time I think of honey, I think of those tiny little things of goodness at Cracker Barrel. Oh, the biscuits at Cracker Barrel are glorious. And when you pour honey on them, they're even better are your words honey or not? The, the psalm, the Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glorify in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear my words and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. Me saying a careless word and forever changing somebody's picture of me is bad. Me saying something colossally stupid or careless, or hurtful, or divisive, or with disdain. And changing people's picture of Jesus is tragic. And we Christians sometimes do a good job. But we need to be reminded that we can sometimes be awful. All the while being very proud that we wash our hands correctly. Did you get that? See what I did there? Came back, that was called back, uh, down, back to the beginning of the message. We're so, so, so very proud of our outward holiness. We're so very proud that we're playing by the rules. Ah, yeah, we do the two cup and two handled cup and we front, back, front, front, back, front, towel, eat the bread, say the prayer, Lord, King of the universe, and then we, we say the prayer, aren't we good? Meanwhile, our words bring division, our words bring anger and rage and malice and fan the flames of what the world is burning with already. And Jesus comes along and says, what comes out of your mouth reflects what's in your heart. One of our Nazarene leaders is a man named Douglas Van Nest, and I like to quote him a lot. He's really smart, and he thinks, he thinks like I want to think. And he said this, if we actually believe that our words have power, as Jesus said they do, if we actually believe that our words have power, and as Jesus told us, reflect the inward state of our heart and character, we would be, and he says this, silent more often. That's actually Bible too. Silent more often, quick to confess. I told you a story a couple weeks ago about something really moronic I said to Grant one time. Grant had done something stupid, and I then thought that the good parenting, you know, thing to do would be equally as stupid. And I said something horrible to Grant, and I almost immediately had to go and apologize. How quick, how quick are you to do that? If we really believed that our words had power, we'd be silent more often, quick to confess, humble in our speech. How you doing? How you doing with that? Did I say silent more often? Just wanted to remind us of that. We would be averse to slander and gossip. Do you remember Veggie Tales? Okay, remember the rumor weed? Wouldn't it be awesome if on a Sunday morning we could just come in and watch the rumor weed one morning? That'd be awesome. Getting youth group flashbacks. Oh. Rumors are rumors even if they're true. We, 
blah, 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 a little too much. Sometimes those things are out and out wrong. They're false. They're made up. They're hurtful. They're divisive. Sometimes they're true, but we shouldn't be saying them because it's not. Ephesians 4. Helpful. It doesn't build up anybody. It doesn't benefit those who listen. Averse to slander and gossip. Generous in our praise and thanks. This is what we should be doing. If we really thought our words had power, did I say silent more often? Yeah, we should be silent more often. This... I've lost the quote, and so I've completely rewritten the quote that I wanted to end with this morning. But it's, it's something like this. Be the kind of follower of Jesus. Be the kind of follower of Jesus that makes unbelievers more likely to believe in a God that loved this world so much that he sent his son. Be the kind of follower of Jesus that even your unbelieving friends who think you and your church and your Jesus is full of hooey, be the kind of believer, be the kind of follower of Jesus, be the kind of Christian that makes even your unbelieving friends and acquaintances more likely to believe in a good and loving and merciful God. They won't if what they hear coming from your mouths is divisive, is full of disdain, is full of barbs and sarcasm. You know, we've done some of this to ourselves, right? We've wrapped our righteous robes around us with our perfectly washed hands. We've wrapped our righteous robes around us and we've stared down our noses and from high and lofty up above everybody else, we've pronounced judgment on a sinful world and we are making Jesus' job even harder. I want to be the type of believer, I want to be the type of person who the words that come out of my mouth make it easier for people to believe in a God that loves this world so much that he sent his son. That's what I want. I'm still working on it. My guess is you are. Do you want to know the true state of your heart? Cheat code here. It's not about how you wash your hands. That's what Jesus was getting back to. If you want to know the true state of your heart, focus less on the frequency of your ritual religious hand washing and all of its little cousins, all the things that we do and we don't do because we're good Christian people. Instead, play back, play back your words at the end of every conversation. Play back your words at the end of every day. See, it's week one in the NFL season, so I'm just going to get way out in front of it and say, go Bears, we're winning the Super Bowl. Yeah! Okay, so play this back in February when we're lifting the Lombardi Trophy. Play back. I'm going to look like a genius then. None of you can prove me wrong right now. Not yet, at least. But they're going to go back tomorrow because the Bears play the Packers this afternoon. They're going to go back tomorrow and show you all the ways the Packers blew it so they lose this afternoon. They're going to show you every play, every fumble, every turnover, every missed block, every missed assignment. They're going to show it. If you applied that to every conversation, if you went back and said, were the words of my mouth, honey, or gravel? Did people see God's light? Or did what I just say bring darkness? If you want to know the true state of your heart, don't go back and check how many times today you washed your hands. Doesn't matter. Jesus knew that, and he was trying to teach us something. Think about the words that you said. What are you going to do about that? 
What am I going to do about that? Would you stand up with me? What are we going to do about this? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to notice. Seriously, in just a second, we're going to pray. In just a second. And right now, you know, Brad Dill's over there thinking, boy, I hope Christy's listening to this. <laughs> no, you, 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 and me. Think about it. Ask the Holy Spirit, help me to notice the words that I say. Help me to notice. Help me to change the way I speak. Help me, paraphrasing Paul here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, help me to hold every word captive and dedicate yourself anew to letting your little light shine. Did you know that in Matthew 5, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, elsewhere he says, I am the light of the world. Okay, you don't have light. Again, let me, let me just say this again. This is awesome, science. The moon has no light. The moon reflects the sun's light. How you doing? How you doing? If just your words were the barometer, if just your words were the test of how bright Jesus is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Dedicate yourself anew to letting his light shine. Would you pray with me? God, help us with this. What we'd love is for the world to see you perfectly and clearly. That the world would know that there's a God who loves. That the world would know that there's a God who has a plan for us to know good and to have peace and to have, uh, to have wholeness, to have freedom from sin and a better way. Often what the world gets is a bunch of noisy Christians and we're not awesome at this. Our words can bring disdain. Our words can bring judgment. Our words can sound condemning. Our words sometimes are very divisive. Your words, Jesus, were hopeful. Your words pointed to your Father who had arms open for this world. Help the world when they see Christians, when they see us this week, help the world not to see a bunch of people who have perfectly washed hands. Help a world hear words of life and hope and joy and peace. Help us, Lord, to better reflect a God that brings light. Help us to pay attention and to change our words. They hold great power. In your great name we pray. Amen.